Um, this presentation is a year late. Uh, last, last winter I had double pneumonia and I wasn't going anywhere. So it's uh, great to be healthy and, and to be back uh, with you all uh, this afternoon. And what a delight to see uh, this uh, room just so full of people. Now, if Lorna Byrne was here, she'd say it was full of angels, too. Probably is, but I can only see you all. Uh, the go- my goal for this talk, by the time we're all done, is that your lives become that much more enchanted. Um, Joseph is our associate. His daughter, uh, L- uh, Evelyn, said uh, she wasn't sure about angels, but she, d- she sure did believe in fairies. Um, I think, you know, to believe in angels, uh, we sing about angels all the time, it just makes our lives that much more enchanted, and I hope that that our talk today uh, will do that for you all. I've always wondered why all the angels at St. Paul's, why did the architect of St. Paul's dip back into medieval uh, concepts such as angels in the 20th century? And there has to be something intentional about it because as you, when you go in the church, you'll see 20 angels on the hammer beams along the side. Uh, you might need your binoculars later, but there's uh, ten angels on top of the arches processing down to the altar to lay their crowns before Jesus. Uh, there are two angels on either side as you go into the church. All of those angels have to express, at least in my mind, some intentionality on the part of the, uh, of the architect. So what are we to make of all these angels? As I mentioned, Lorna Byrne, who's a, an Irish mystic who sees angels just the way you and I see each other, uh, came here five years ago, and we were up in the office. She was in the corner, and I was behind the desk, and I asked her afterwards, well, tell me, you know, what did you see in there? <laughs> so, so, so this is what she said. She said, um, at one stage... I watched you standing at your desk, and your guardian angel stood behind you. It was such a powerful force, a bit like a pillar of strength behind you, giving you the courage and strength to do the work you do. Your guardian angel was dressed in garments that looked heavy. I don't want to say they were like a cloak. They were a fawn color with a design in different shades of gold and red embroidered into it, I didn't say wings, they don't always show them. So it's fascinating just to imagine that we're accompanied in our lives by angels. There's something enchanting about that. Now, Lorna Byrne is illiterate, uh, and yet she has published six books that have been translated into 26 languages. And that, you would think, should give me enough assurance that what she said is true. But... I'm I'm on the board of the Center for Contemporary Mysticism, and every time the board gets a little too mystical, they they start to laugh and say, "Uh uh-oh, we're losing Cliff again. And so so I went and I asked my associate if he knew a contemporary serious theologian that believed in angels, and he did, and he does. And the theologian's name is uh, David Bentley Hart. And Hart says that to believe in angels is simply our rational response to one of the ways the world presents itself to us. It's reasonable to believe, he writes, that behind the outer forms of nature, there might be an unperceived realm of intelligent order. The world, he says, just seems to address us that way. Angels are an enchanting way of encountering a world that has a lot of mystery in it. And so he would argue that angels are rational, but they also, they're a rational way of understanding the world that has a lot of mystery. Now you might say that the angels called St. Paul's Church into being. They, uh, were it not for the transcendent longings the angels embodied, Hart says, or for the ecstatic creativity those longings evoked, there'd be no church here at all. 
creativity, he says, is not something that just wells within, but is something outside ourselves that calls us forward. And uh, those creative um, uh, capacities, the symbols and imaginative capacities, flow down from above. The angels drew Clarence Zanzinger out of himself, calling him forward to that which did not exist yet, and he designed an enchanting church. But angels also, for the same reason, can be disturbing. They urge us to go beyond where we are. Angels carry news of journeys to be taken, changes to be made, demands to be met, churches to be designed, tasks to be carried out, growing to be done. Angels are messengers that carry us forward to where we are not yet. And because of that, they can discombobulate us a bit. Now, think about theologians as bookends uh, with the Enlightenment in the middle. David Bentley Hart is a theologian on our end of the Enlightenment. If you go back 300 years, Lancelot Andrews might be a theologian on the, uh, on the other end of this bookend. Before the Puritan distrust of mystery, the Puritans wanted to base their uh, uh, reasoning on, on the word, the rational word. And three centuries of enlightenment um, focused us on technology and determinism. And Lancelot Andrews comes before that and seriously considers uh, the role of angels in our life. Lancelot Andrews was born nine years before Shakespeare, and he died as the Bishop of Winchester in 1626. Andrews describes angels uh, as creatures of God from whom they are given life. They are heavenly spirits, and although wholly spiritual, they are not shadows. There's something substantial there. It's not just a shadow. Although invisible, they have spirit. Although immortal and incorruptible, yet not so immortal that God may destroy them. <laughs> they still, they're, not, they're not immortal the way God is. A- Andrew's warned against seeing angels as mediators. It's not sound theology, he said, to think of angels offering up our prayers to God as mediators. Uh, for there's no, no uh, ground for that in Scripture, he said. Nor should we pray to angels or perform any worship to them, as all our prayers should be addressed to God. So that's, we have David Bentley Hart and Lancelot Andrews uh, on either side. What happened in between them? For the reformers, after Andrews, the, the word became the route to understanding. Everything else was mud in the water. But if you had the word, uh, you could trust that. God, for them, was an intellectual system, not a mystery. And I think the angels of St. Paul's, as you'll see in a minute, introduce mystery back into our worship. Uh, that's why this is an enchanting church. Uh, it, it introduces mystery back in. Remember, in the 1600s, we're ending, entering the Age of Enlightenment. The next 300 years were marked by rationality over transcendence. Uh, and you can think of four names that stretch over that period. Uh, you have Galileo in 1564 to 1642, Isaac Newton 1642 to 1727, Caroline Herschel, the astronomer from 1750 to 1848, Charles Darwin from 1809 to 1882. Now, I'm glad for the scientific advances, advancements of the Enlightenment. Let me tell you, I'm glad that we have the medicine we have to do today and everything else. So don't get me wrong about that. But the construction, shortly before the construction of St. Paul's Church, the solid atomic structure of the universe was shaken. Quantum theory had its beginnings in 1900 with Max Planck's research into radiation. Quantum theory uh, challenged the former determinism. And, uh, and so for St. Paul's and uh, thinkers of that time, it was the occasion to bring back mystery into, way, into the way that we looked at the world. Now, so you have before the Enlightenment, 
angel roofs. Angel roofs were begun in England in the 1400s. Uh, and I don't know that you saw too many from about 1600 on. Uh, certainly the Puritans in some occasions, if you go back into England, you'll see poor angels had their heads chopped off and, and uh, because they thought they were devotional uh, statues, which wasn't the case at all. But now, uh, after 1900, you have the angel roof in St. Paul's. And I've seen two other angel roofs as well. One is at the Church of the Savior in town uh, in West Philadelphia. That is now the Episcopal, the Philadelphia Episcopal Cathedral. And also Holy Cross Roman Catholic Parish in Mount Airy has an angel roof. Uh, and so the Church of the Savior, that roof was built in 1906. Uh, Holy Cross and St. Paul's were about the same time. Uh, Holy Cross in 1929, St. Paul's in uh, 1928. Though perhaps less load-bearing today, St. Paul's, for instance, is a modern steel structure, uh, they still perform their purpose of lifting our gaze Think of uh, people's posture today. You see someone and they got their cell phone out and they're kind of looking down like this. You walk into the church and you see the angels and you're, you know, your, your, your gaze goes upward and outward. They lift you. Angels are all about transcendence, about having us look, look up. Um, and uh, to believe in angels, David Hart says, is to live an enchanted life. Now, he says, what threatens civilization as much as anything is disenchantment. And we're so, we are so disenchanted today. Uh, the age of technology makes it hard to live an enchanted life. Uh, we're disenchanted with government. Uh, surveys uh, show that. <coughs> just, just the angels, don't worry. <laughs> We're disenchanted with the church. Attendance uh, declines. We're disenchanted with work. Sometimes it seems we're going round and round and not getting anywhere. Uh, but there's hope. Hart says America's angels, as opposed to their uh, old world counterparts, have kept their mysterious transcendence intact to this day. And with it, their power to inspire spiritual longing, sometimes, he said, of the most extravagant kind. Our angels continue to move in their inaccessible heavens, apparently still calling out to mortals uh, to provoke our sons and daughters, to prophesy our old men, to dream dreams, and our young men to uh, see visions. The angels want us to live enchanted lives. I think civilization demands that we live enchanted lives. And uh, maybe now, before we venture over toward the church, I might just stop and ask, do you have any questions? I've kind of talked a, talked a bit here, and hopefully we can have more dialogue as we continue on, but I wanted to get some of that out. Anybody have questions? Yeah. Well, one thing is attending RSCM with the, with the choristers a couple mm. of years. Yeah, my biblical, yeah, my guess is probably the Middle Ages in the Bible. We'll talk about uh, Michael in a minute, uh, and uh, and and of course in the Old Testament you have cherubim and seraphim. Some of the angels over the altar in the stained glass you could probably call cherubim or seraphim, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but I think angels, um, as I said, are disturbing because they call us to move. They call us on journeys. They call us to change, um, and that's not always comfortable. Um, any other questions? Anything? Yeah. Do you have a favorite angel? Yeah. I, um, I'm not sure I do. I like St. Michael, or uh, the Archangel Michael. And, and part, of it, part of it is, you know, when you go out, we'll, we'll look up at the uh, western wall of the church, Michael is standing over everyone that comes into the church, kind of with with protection and peace. Um, so, someone asked me if 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 my guardian angel that uh, Lorna Burns saw, if I gave that guardian angel a name, um, no. <laughs> but it's very comforting to think that behind me is this force uh, and courage and strength. Um, but I don't have a name. Yeah. Can you articulate? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think the uh, there's, I guess, seven archangels that are mentioned in the Bible, and they are known by names. I don't really know. Uh, I guess they are the the heads of uh, a multitude of heavenly hosts behind them. I'm not really sure of the distinction. Hmm? They're the managers. The managers, okay. They're the managers. <laughs> middle, middle level. Yeah, middle level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. I know what it is about Michael Cliff. What it is? What is it? It's the pie. The pie? Tell me more about the Michael pie. You didn't see the movie with John Travolta? Oh, I missed it. Yeah, yeah, okay. He likes the pie. Good, good, excellent. Yeah. We have, uh, in the church at the end of our tour, uh, we have a labyrinth in the west end of the tour, and uh, I often will have an angel walk at the labyrinth, and and I'll place some pocket angels in the center, so you can go, uh, you can walk the labyrinth, and then get to the center and have a a little angel coin that you can carry back out with you. Yes. What is your grandchild's name? Our grandchild's name is Emerson Sky Cutler, oh. and the sky is S K Y E. Yeah, yeah. I know. Well. They got the sky in there anyway. <laughs> Let's go outside. It's a little chilly, but I'd like, to, I'd like you to step outside the Port Cushare and look up at the Archangel Michael on the western wall. So follow me. And so, you know, in the book of Revelation, you have uh, uh, Michael uh, drove Lucifer out of heaven. Michael's also mentioned in the book of Daniel and the letter of Jude. Uh, Michael was the great prince in the book of Daniel that supported the Israelites through their 70 years of captivity in Babylon. And in the letter of Jude, he disputed with Satan over the body of Moses. Michael, Michael wards off evil and uh, brings peace at the end of our life journey. And so Michael is up at the top of the wall. Whenever you go into this church, you go in under the protection of the uh, archangel Michael, which I think is, is cool. How did I know? Okay, so my, Michael is holding a sword, for one thing. And, uh, and I know Paul holds a sword, too, but I know it's not Paul because that fellow's got wings. So I think, that's, I think that's Michael. And I got a nice picture of Michael by climbing the tower of this building and looking straight across. Um, I didn't climb it on the outside. I climbed it on the outside. And then as we go in the church... You'll notice an angel on either side, and then uh, there are, uh, I guess, eight more angels, four, eight, eight more angels on the tympanum, this uh, curved piece above, carved stone above the door. I think the architect had to, had to want everybody to just believe that when they walked into this church, they were surrounded by angels, yeah. So they've got two big angels, and then uh, eight, eight uh, angels above. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're surrounded by angels. So come on in. Are we all in yet? And there's some chairs if you need to sit down. <clears throat> when Lorna Byrne was here, she said she could see angels all along the side of the church. And she said there was a big angel in the balcony. Uh, how did she put it? There's a huge one, she said. I have to say a beautiful angel up in the balcony there behind everybody. So here we have, uh, you have the angel roof. You can see the angels along the hammer beams all the way up. There are uh, 10 on each side. So there's 20 angels on the hammer beam. The word angel comes from the Greek. It means messenger. So these divine messengers uh, bearing the word of God were carved by a wood carver by the name of Johann Kirkmeyer from the Ross Company of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Johann John Kirkmeyer has been described as the greatest wood carver since the Middle Ages. That's pretty pretty remarkable. He was born in 1860 in, in, in uh, Oberammergau, uh, Bavaria. After learning learning sculpture in Germany, he came to this country at the age of 20 and uh, began doing work in church uh, sculpture. Now, what's fascinating to me about these angels uh, is um, 
They're, they're part of a, the kind of the modern technology of this church. Uh, this is, a, as I said, a steel frame church. The a- hammer beam angels aren't load bearing. They're, uh, they're attached to uh, steel beams that come out. Um, they, uh, uh, kind of the modern technology, uh, wanted to express speed, democracy, the new science. Um, uh, Lancelot Andrews again writes that angels are God's swift messengers. Uh, whom he uses to bestow his mercy and the preservation of his truth. And I think we can see that swiftness in the uh, hammer beam angels. We ready to move forward? Question. Yes, question. The hammer beam a- <clears throat> angels, are mm. they all each one piece of wood? That's a really good question. I think if you, it looks like the arms are separate pieces. I think I can see some uh, uh, some lines. If it were all one piece of wood, that beam would have had to have been this wide to start with and cut the bottom away to get the arms in there. So it would make sense that the arms were identical. Good for you. Yeah. I think I can see uh, the seam on the arms. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's move forward to the uh, steps. When you come up here, you'll be able to see above the uh, arches... Uh, kind of angels at the pinnacle and even with binoculars and I've got actually do people want some binoculars I've got three binoculars here that I can share with folks look at the uh, at the top of each arch in the in the center you can see uh, angels and uh, with binoculars you can see them better uh, I couldn't tell when I first looked at them, even with binoculars, what they were holding in their hands. Uh, but they're holding crowns in their hands. And it's a reference to the book of Revelation where uh, the, uh, the elders cast their crowns before the altar of God Almighty. Uh, and so these angels are, are processing forward to cast their crowns uh, before uh, Jesus uh, in the stained glass to cast the crowns before the throne, before Jesus, uh, the Savior of the world. Now, what someone asked about uh, or talked about the detail carving that no one is going to see. When we put in the new sound system here, there was scaffolding that went way up to the, uh, to the top of these arches. And I asked one of the workmen if he would take his camera with him and take a picture of the angels. And then, then I could see they were carrying crowns. But he came back and he was just awestruck. He said, Cliff, even the toenails on these angels are carved. Now, nobody's ever going to want it. Nobody's ever going to know that. Nobody would ever see it. Uh, but the detail, he didn't sacrifice any of the detail. I like to think with, uh, like Carson Wentz of the Eagles, he had an audience of one, you know, <laughs> that God knew, and he carved every detail of those angels. <clears throat> now, if you would uh, train your binoculars to the stained glass window above the Jesus figure in little football, football shapes, you'll see little angels up there, and the angels are, are of different color. They're white angels, black angels, brown angels. All the angels are, uh, represent kind of the multi, multiplicity of races that make up our country. And uh, now realize that that window was, uh, was created in 1929. So as early as 1929, there was an intention of inclusion of all races and peoples uh, looking, looking over um, Jesus and the world. So I, I, th- I like to think it's uh, angels represent all of us and all of our diversity and all of our beauty. Okay, so the, the wooden, wood-carved saints represent the different ministries of the church. The center represents worship. Jesus is at the very center. His hand is raised in blessing. To Jesus' right, our left, is uh, the disciple John. And John usually is holding a chalice. And then to Jesus' left, to our right, is Paul. And Paul is holding a sword. And it's uh, a reference to the letter to the uh, uh, Ephesians uh, that talks about the sword of the Spirit. And then if you go up on the uh, top, on either side... The top is meant to represent teaching or preaching. 
You have Phillips Brooks on the right, who was a famous preacher at the turn of the last century. And you have uh, St. Mark. And there's a, lot, there's a whole uh, teaching segment of the Gospel of Mark. And then if you go down one, the person on the right-hand side is uh, William Hobart Hare, who was our second rector, who, who was elected bishop of the Great Sioux Nation. And we take our young people out to the Standing Rock Reservation each summer and to keep that connection. William Hobart Hare's name in Sioux was Swift Bird, and I, I can't pronounce the Sioux name for that, but it translated into English, it's Swift Bird. You'll see if you can get up close there, or maybe with binoculars, there's a bird flying at, at, uh, at the bottom of that statue uh, by uh, William Hobart Hare's feet. On the other side, uh, still talking about mission, is uh, um, Bartholomew. Is that right? Uh, the one who went with Paul on his mission trips. Bartima- no, Bartholomew, I think. And then down below on the, the lowest level, so that's uh, at the top it's teaching, in the middle it's uh, mission, in the bottom it is uh, uh, pastoral care. And so on the right hand at the bottom, you have um, and, uh, and J. Andrews Harris, who was rector here from 1860-something to 1910 or so. He was rector for 50 years. And so, you know, if you're here 50 years, they make a statue of you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah. So, and then on the other side at the bottom is St. Timothy, and Timothy is one of the pastoral letters, so it's pastoral care at the bottom. And then in stained glass, uh, below Jesus are all in, in, images of uh, St. Paul's life. Um, so that's that. Uh, if you want to come forward, there's angels carved in the stone altar. Do you see the angels that are carved here? Now they've got wings. These are angels, and part of the and you can come in here if you want. Part of the idea with the angels and the altar is that all our worship uh, has to do with uh, the praise of angels that were surrounded with angels. Every Eucharist, most every Eucharist, we begin with uh, what's called the glory and excelsis, or the glory to God. It's the song of the angels at Jesus' birth. Glory to God. Uh, and peace, goodwill towards all whom God is pleased with is the actual translation. So the, that hymn was sung at the birth of Jesus. Uh, angels surround the altar at the uh, Eucharist when we sing the Sanctus, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might. It comes from uh, the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah is in the temple and uh, and uh, the angels, the seraphs, sing to one another, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. Uh, in the Eastern Church, the Eastern Church does a lot more with angels than the Western Church does. So in the Eastern Church, Lancelot Andrews said, when the priest finished the Eucharist, he referred to uh, this passage from Isaiah where the seraph takes a hot coal and touches it to uh, Isaiah's lips and says, Isaiah is all concerned about not being worthy. And uh, touching uh, Isaiah's lips, the uh, angel says, uh, you know, your, your guilt is blotted out. The priest in the Eastern Church at the end of the Eucharist would say, the sacrament has touched your lips and all uh, your guilt and, and sins are uh, wiped away. So, uh, and then in the season of Advent and Lent, we often use what's called the Trisagion, which is the uh, three times holy. That also refers to Isaiah and the um, uh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So all our worship uh, is, we're surrounded uh, with the angels. The morning prayer canticle, you are God, goes to you, all angels, all powers of heaven, cherubim, cherub, cherubim and seraphim, uh, sing endless praise, uh, holy, holy, holy Lord. And then at Compline, Compline is the prayer service we say at the end of the day before we retire for the night. And as you imagine, there's angels mentioned there as well. Uh, we often use Psalm 91, for he shall give his angels charge over you. 
Uh, one of the Compline prayers goes, Visit this place, O Lord, and drive far from it all snares of the enemy. Let your holy angels dwell with us to preserve us in peace. And often children will have an instinctual sense of angels. All it takes is a, lo- is a, a few words from a loving parent to uh, uh, put the child to sleep uh, with, uh, uh, with, the, with the angels and maybe the soft beat of angel wings, and that child is fast asleep. So we do the same thing in the church with our, with our Compline worship. Over by the uh, organ console, there are angels holding hymnals. <laughs> Can you see them? The light, there you go. And so uh, the angels are holding hymnals. Angels are mentioned in all the in many hymns in the church. So you have the Christmas hymns, Let the Heights of Heaven Adore Him, uh, Angel Hosts His Praises Sing. You have the Christmas carol, Sing Choirs of Angels, Sing in Exaltation, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. But there's all, there's, uh, angels in, in, in regular uh, hymns as well, such as Songs of Praise the Angels Sang, Heaven with Alleluias Rang, Jesus Came Adored by Angels, Came with Peace from Realms on High, Ye Holy Angels Bright, who wait at God's right hand. And then the last act of service the angels do is to carry up, carry us up at the end to God's presence. And so two of the hymns are, uh, Into Paradise, May the Angels Lead You, May the Choirs of angel, Angels Lead You to Paradise on High. And so that's uh, where we are here. We're going to go back to the labyrinth in a minute. Joe, look at the uh, the prayer benches because there's beautiful winged angels right uh, on the uh, prayer benches there. When we when we put the lighting system, uh, we had a, a lift, and uh, and parishioners with vacuum cleaners and so forth went all over those angels. Now, what's fascinating is, even when they cleaned them, they looked dusty because the wood is discolored over all those years. So they're they're not as dusty as they look, but. <laughs> I'm sure they're dusty. We ready to walk back to the labyrinth? Now, when uh, when Jesus called Nathaniel to be his disciple, he said, you'll see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. I think the angels invite us on a journey, and so the labyrinth is one of the ways to take that journey. And there are some uh, little booklets that I have here uh, to do an angel labyrinth walk. So if you want to do that... Um, uh, you can you can uh, pass some of those out. You can do an angel labyrinth walk, and I'll put a little um, a little dish of pocket angels in the center if you want to do the walk and take a, a pocket angel out with you. Um, it's just kind of a, a fun way to think about how the angels call us outside of ourselves on journeys and life changes and so forth. So. Um, that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to uh, share with you. Um, we can go back into the Dixon house where there are angel cookies, uh, little little peace angels if you want to buy. Uh, maybe that uh, cider is mulled by now. I don't know. And uh, at 4 o'clock, we're going to have a service called Rosemary for Remembrance. And uh, we have two musicians who've come up. One plays the viola da gamba and another plays guitar and fiddle. And they'll be playing some old, old carols uh, while we gather uh, just for a service of peace. If, uh, if Christmas is getting a little to you and you want some peace, that'll be a service at four o'clock. And then if you've lost some, if, you, if, you, if you've experienced a loss over the season and, and Christmas is a little bit tough, uh, it's a service for that too. So we've got about an hour between now and the service, plenty of time to walk the labyrinth. Um, are there any questions before we go in for the uh, reception? Anything else? Want to go back into Dixon House for some angel cookies? Thank you. All right, you're welcome, you're welcome. Oh, you're welcome, thank you.